We're told often enough that the Internet of Things is here. But what I think we sometimes forget is that it's principally about sensors and the data that they produce. And that being the case, now seems like a good time to talk about the five things that we never talk about when we talk about sensors and sensor data. And if that last animation went a little quickly for you, don't worry. I've created and copyrighted this handy, easy to remember acronym and given it a hashtag to show you how now I am. So the first thing about sensors and sensor data that some of the more breathless commentaries overlook is this. Sensors sometimes lie. And this often comes as a big surprise to business and IT people who tend to assume that because smart devices never come to work hungover or distracted after a row with a partner, that everything they record can be assumed to be complete, consistent, and accurate. But actually, if you talk to the hardware engineers that deploy and maintain sensor data networks, you'll rapidly discover that nothing could be further from the truth. Here's a trivial example. These aren't my legs. I have a stunt double. But these are my data. And my heart rate monitor would have you believe that during a recent 30-minute treadmill workout, my heart rate came down to the 70 beats per minute mark and stayed there for several minutes. But if you'd had the misfortune of working out alongside me, you'd know that that absolutely, definitely was not the case. Here's a much more interesting example, no stunt double required. The extreme temperature range that desert oil field sensors are exposed to means that they very often start to drift almost as soon as they've been deployed and installed. Downhole sensors can't easily be replaced because whilst the sensors themselves are so cheap that they're almost free, the cost of the lost production incurred in replacing them most definitely is not. Now, if you think about it, you know that sensors sometimes lie, and you also know what to do about it. Your own body is highly instrumented, and your own sensors sometimes lie to you. Ever felt like you were falling when you were standing still, for example? Or felt dizzy when you got up too quickly? You compensate for a bad read from one of your own sensors by corroborating the suspect data with data from your other sensors. In a similar way, we can compensate for a drifting oil field sensor by, for example, creating a virtual sensor from a neural network of adjacent sensor readings. Now, different approaches are more or less relevant for different use cases and for different scenarios. But whichever approach we take, the important thing to understand is this. Sensor data need to be managed. We can't assume that machine-generated data is complete, consistent, and accurate just because it was generated by a machine. The second thing we need to understand about sensors is that even when they're not lying, they may not tell us the whole truth. Sensors typically sit behind control units, control units that were designed to support remote control and administration of the entire device, not to capture, store, and forward high-frequency data from each individual sensor. And those control units very often filter and summarize data. Now, that's not always automatically a bad thing, by the way. Sensor data can be extremely redundant and repetitive, and it may not make sense to capture, never mind to transmit from a remote location, very large volumes of data that amount to sensors telling us 5,000 times a second, nothing much to report here, nothing very much has changed since the last reading. Look at this illustrative example on the slide behind me. Should we care about this first above threshold reading circle in orange? Well, maybe not. It's not a very high reading. It didn't last for very long. But on the other hand, if it could have helped me predict the next two way above threshold readings that occurred a little later, then actually it is a very interesting data point. And it's precisely because what is noise for one application may be vitally important signal for another that at the very minimum, we need to understand how and where sensor data has been summarized and filtered. And in very many cases, our ambition should be to try and capture raw sensor data and avoid this kind of premature summarization. The third thing about sensor data is that extracting useful signal from noisy time series data typically requires lots of analytics and additional data. The first sensor data analytic applications are over a decade old already, and studying them can tell us a lot about both the challenges and the opportunities associated with the next generation of sensor data analytic applications. 
Expensive and safety critical systems have been instrumented for a long time already, and at Teradata, we've built preventative maintenance solutions across a variety of industries and a variety of geographies. We help the US Army, for example, increase helicopter readiness by between 5 and 8%. We've helped Union Pacific Railroad reduce bearing-related derailment incidents by up to 75%. We help a leading manufacturer of paper mills avoid the mother of all paper jams in their mile-long plant and equipment. We help keep the lights on by predicting failures in electricity distribution networks before they occur. And we help a European train operator predict failures of trains up to 36 hours before they occur. More on that in just a moment. Now, the interesting thing about all of these projects and applications is that despite their apparent diversity, from 50,000 feet, they mostly look pretty similar. For sure, all of these applications depend upon the availability of relevant sensor data, temperature, pressure, vibration, etc., etc., measurements. But we typically need to pre-process that raw sensor data to identify significant changes of state, events, and that requires time series analytics. We very often need to label the event data if we want to train a supervised predictive model, which very often requires that we do text analytics on engineering reports to extract fault and resolution details. When we have labeled event data, we typically want to understand the sequence of events that leads up to a particular outcome or that doesn't lead to a particular outcome, which requires path analytics. And because understanding events and relationships is very often important for these applications, relationships, for example, between different components and between different events, typically we also need to leverage graph analytics and association analytics. The actual predictive models that underpin many of these applications are often very similar and based on, for example, decision trees or logistic regression. But the process of creating a usable and useful analytic data set from time series data is often anything but simple. And so to the fourth thing about sensors and sensor data. Sensors typically don't measure the quantity of interest directly. The wearable device on your wrist, for example, isn't directly measuring your sleep cycle. To do that, it would need to be connected to electrodes that were attached to your head and that, was me that were measuring brainwave activity. And who wants to go to sleep wired up like a lab rat? Instead, sensors on the device are measuring your pulse, and the frequency and the intensity of your nocturnal movements, and the device is inferring whether you're asleep or not. A model that was built somewhere else is being scored in near real time on your wrist as you sleep. Now, of course, the model building and the model scoring processes are typically separate and distinct, even where they leverage the same data and the same infrastructure. But in the case of IoT applications and use cases, they're often very distinct processes, with model scoring often taking place on a network of distributed edge servers or on the smart devices themselves. Now, there are sound and good reasons for distributing model scoring in this way. Many of the smart devices have more than enough computing power to score a simple model like our sleep model. And distributing the scoring in this way can improve reliability and availability by, for example, isolating the smart devices from local network failures. But it's important to appreciate that not all models can be scored locally on the device. Some models may be intended to optimize the performance of end-to-end -end systems or to optimize the performance of an entire fleet of devices. And of course, building the model in the first place and tuning it afterwards typically require that we aggregate historical whole fleet data, data from very many sensors. And so to the last thing about sensors and sensor data. By itself, sensor data is often almost useless, or at least not actionable. Say, for example, we get a temporary, uh, a, a, an oil pressure sensor on one of the trains that we described earlier, temporarily exceeds a threshold value. Should we worry or regard it as a blip? Well, in order to make a sensible determination, we first need to compare the current data with the signatures that have preceded historic failures. And as we've already described, that requires the analysis not just of sensor data, but also of operations data and repair and maintenance data. Assuming there's a match for that signature, we then have some tough decisions to make. If we're predicting a failure of the gearbox on the train, can we wait until the train gets to the end of the line, or do we need an engineer to meet the train en route? And if we need an engineer to meet the train en route, is a suitably qualified and experienced engineer available? Is the relevant spare part available? 
And we can't answer any of those questions just by relating to the sensor data alone. We need the operations data, the HR data, et cetera, et cetera. And so we see that the truism that data love data is especially the case for sensor data. Failure to plan for the integration of sensor data with other sensor data and with other data from around the organization amounts to planning to fail with your IoT initiative. But according to Gartner, that's exactly what very many of us are doing. So let me briefly recap on all of that. The Internet of Things, it's about the sensor data, stupid. The data that those sensors produce is an unreliable, unwilling, and in some cases downright deceitful witness to the events that we care about. Remember the five things that we never talk about when we talk about sensors and sensor data. Understand their implications and develop a strategy and a plan which allows you to mitigate them. If you've enjoyed this session, I do encourage you to come and see Frank Soibelik and Eliano Marquez at 11.15. They'll have much more time to go into the details around all of this than I've had today. I thank you very much indeed for your time and attention, and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you.